Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Derm Docs, powered by LiveDerm. This marks the fourth episode of our ongoing series, a program on JAK inhibitors for atopic dermatitis, hosted by expert dermatologist Dr. Christopher Bunick, Associate Professor of Dermatology at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Our fourth episode, Setting the Stage, Effective Onboarding of Your AD Patients onto JAK Inhibitor Therapy, features Dr. Ruthann Vlagels, Heidi and Scott C. Schuster, Distinguished Chair of Dermatology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Chestnut Hills, Massachusetts. Welcome back, all our listeners, to another episode of our program on JAK Inhibitors for Atopic Dermatitis. We have a very special episode for you today titled Setting the Stage, Effective Onboarding of Your AD Patients onto Oral JAK Inhibitor Therapy. I'm Dr. Christopher Bunick, uh, an Associate Professor of Dermatology at Yale University School of Medicine. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, a dear friend and colleague of mine that I've known for almost a quarter century. 24 years ago, we started uh, medical school together at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. We dissected cadavers together. We had our first dermatology lectures together. And so none other than Dr. Ruth Ann Vlagels. She is the Heidi and Scott Schuster Distinguished Chair in Dermatology at Brigham and Women's Hospital Department of Dermatology and Senior Medical Director at Mass General Brigham. She serves as the Director of the Autoimmune Skin Disease Program, Connective Tissue Disease Clinics, and Atopic Dermatitis Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and is co-director of the Rheumatology Dermatology Program at Boston Children's Hospital. There's many more I could say about her, but everyone knows that Dr. Ruth Ann Vlagels is a superstar, and I'm so happy that you're here with me today uh, for this podcast, Ruth Ann. Thanks, Chris. You're the only person who could give me that introduction, and it does take me back to those anatomy dissection days. I appreciate it. Excellent. Well, we're going to have a wonderful packed program here about onboarding of JAK inhibitors. And in particular, this first segment, we're really going to just kind of get an overview of oral JAK inhibitors. And and so, Ruthann, when did you first start using oral JAK inhibitors? So that's that also takes me back because, Chris, as you know well, uh, our first oral JAK inhibitor, our New England Journal of Medicine article came out in 2011. Right, 2012, excuse me. And in 2012, essentially, we had tofacitinib for rheumatoid arthritis. And as you just learned, because I live in sort of this overlap derm room world, we really started work using uh, oral JAK inhibitors really early. So essentially, we got approval by the FDA for oral tofacitinib November of that year. And pretty much by December and January, we were starting to use oral JAK inhibitors in our derm room patients. And so because I sort of where this dual hat of leading our atopic derm program as well as our derm room program, this has sort of been a nice connection for me because I actually was the first person to use JAK inhibitors in dermatomyositis. We've published our cohort on that now, you know, almost a decade ago, and then really have got more and more involved in using JAK inhibitors in other connective tissue diseases. So it's a very easy transition into using them frequently in atopic dermatitis and other autoimmune diseases as well. Were there any surprises like, when you first started using them? Were you, was there an aha moment like, wow, these medicines are game changing? Okay, that is also a great question. So the first patient I treated with a JAK inhibitor was a woman in her 20s who had literally been on eight therapies for her very severe cutaneous dermatomyositis. She just had disfiguring, horribly itchy, miserable disease. And she literally sent me a text message because clearly we were on very, very close communication at that point. And within only a couple weeks of therapy, she was noticing a change. So one of the things that, of course, we'll talk about when we think about JAK inhibitors in general is the fact that they have a very rapid onset of action, right? And so that's one of the important features of this category of medications. And so this was sort of my first aha moment was literally the first patient, which was, oh, Hugh, this is working. She's been really, really tough to get better but also that she was seeing improvement very rapidly. And I think that was a big aha moment for me and sort of spurred my use of these agents in dermatomyositis, which is really how I sort of cemented my expertise in this, you know, starting about a decade ago. Do you remember when you first used a JAK inhibitor for atopic dermatitis? Okay, so this is another great question because, of course, we're talking about a lot of off-label stuff right now because, of course, JAK inhibitors are still off-label for dermatomyositis. As we got our comfort level with these, you know, very high early on, 
sort of an overlapping autoimmune diseases, we essentially started reaching for JAK inhibitors when we had patients who had concomitant autoimmune, autoinflammatory, inflammatory diseases. So I sort of vividly remember I had a patient probably back in 2014, I'd say, who had alopecia areata, atopic dermatitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. And interestingly, as I know you know, Chris, there is a connection to some of the anti-TNF therapies and alopecia areata. And this patient had sort of thought that her TNF alpha inhibitor had actually sort of spurred on her alopecia areata or exacerbated it. And so we were sort of looking for one medication that could help with all of these various uh, conditions. And that was this first patient that I was like, well, we're going to use this because not only could it fix the alopecia areata as well as the potentially the inflammatory bowel disease, but she also has atopic dermatitis that was quite severe. And thankfully, that patient had all three of her diseases improve on oral JAK inhibition. And in fact, she's still on oral JAK inhibition to this day. So with that background, so let's think about the oral JAK inhibitors and the current landscape of AD treatment, right? Obviously, now in AD, we have two approved oral JAK inhibitors in the United States, the avercitinib and the apatacitinib. And then in Europe, I believe they also have baricitinib for atopic dermatitis. But with, with regard to the United States, uh, how do you feel the JAK inhibitors are, are fitting into the landscape of AD treatment? Okay, so that's a really great, great question. So one thing I like to remind people is that I mentioned this briefly, but these medicines have a very rapid onset of action. And so what I would love is if my dermatology colleagues as a whole would rely less on using systemic steroids as an off switch for atopic dermatitis, because what we find is that those patients end up getting systemic steroid side effects and often just end up on repeated tapers, et cetera and really realize that they could actually reach for an oral JAK inhibitor for an off switch for atopic dermatitis. And Chris, as I'm sure you have many examples, I would assume, you know, we have patients who literally within a day or two of taking their medicine actually already notice like pretty rapid itch reduction, right? And so, you know, there's just not that many things in dermatology that we can use as an off switch. And I think this is a really important point when thinking about how we treat our atopic dermatitis patients and probably a really important sort of like paradigm shift for many of my colleagues, like just don't even give them systemic steroids, give them something that's safer that we can turn that disease off quickly and is a safe long-term option for them. Yeah, I really love what you just said because the updated uh, AAD, atopic dermatitis guidelines actually uh, strongly recommend against the use of systemic corticosteroids. And I, I'm a big uh, believer in not using the systemic corticosteroids. I think the way you phrased it as an an off switch, because that's the really the way dermatologists use steroids. It's, it's what do I do? I got to do something quick. Let's use the steroids as an off switch. But in reality, what we're saying, and to a degree is that the jack inhibitors can function as that first line rapid onset off switch. Uh, that's at least from a practical standpoint, that's what they can achieve. Yes. And I completely agree with that. So, you know, even let's say pre-JAK inhibitors. If I was like lecturing to trainees about, you know, how we need to turn diseases off, you know, clearly I was an expert in using the more traditional medications like methotrexate, mycophenolate, et cetera. But none of those function like off switches, right? Like they really take three months to take effect in this type of condition. And so in those patients, often we would give this like systemic steroid bridge. And I would just say, please just don't give the systemic steroid alone if they really need it. Make sure you're starting your other agent day one. But like that has just changed now. We don't even have to use that bridge in our JAK inhibitor patients. We can just completely avoid the side effects of systemic steroids, which is, I think, you know, game changing in this disease. Yeah, I completely agree. So, so let's move on to the, the, the second segment here and focus on the ideal candidate, the ideal patient for oral JAK inhibitor therapy. Are there any specific criteria that you use to select patients who you think would benefit most from oral JAK inhibitors? Okay, so this is a great question. And I think we can think of this in two parts. We can think of it as like, who has the type of disease that really needs a JAK inhibitor? And then also, who's my best candidate to get a JAK inhibitor? And so I'd say for the first part, you know, a, a couple things. What I want people to start thinking of is, again, who do I need to turn this disease off quickly, 
if I'm even thinking about reaching for systemic steroids, I really need to think about whether a JAK inhibitor would be a better option for that patient. I also want to start have my colleagues start thinking about atopic dermatitis like we think about psoriasis, which is that we can have psoriasis patients essentially be close to clear and essentially close to free of symptoms. And what I don't want is I don't want my atopic dermatitis patients to get, you know, 40 to 50% better, 40 to 60% better, and then we just call it a day, right? You know, I want to make sure that we're getting our atopic dermatitis patients really a, to like high level of functioning and you know, like dramatically reduced itch. And so sort of pushing the envelope and realizing that we can get there um, and probably the category of medicines that we can use to do so is often a JAK inhibitor. So I'd say that's sort of like the answer to the first part. And then the second part is really thinking like who can get a JAK inhibitor? And that's probably what I have the most experience on because I've just been giving JAK inhibitors for so long. And so I think a couple things are important, which is I think when my Durham colleagues are sort of starting thinking about like, who can I give a JAK inhibitor to? They think it's like this narrow segment of the population. Like, oh, I'm looking for the perfect candidate. And it's actually, interestingly, it's kind of the opposite, right? Like almost all patients are actually a good candidate for a JAK inhibitor. It's a small pool of patients that you want to say, maybe this isn't the best person for a JAK inhibitor. Okay. And I think if we talk about that, we're using data really from our rheumatoid arthritis patient population. And it's a very different population than our atopic dermatitis population. Um, it's an older population. It's a sicker population. They have more, more comorbidities. They have baseline increased risk of you know, cardiac disease and clotting, et cetera. But because we have that data, we can still use it to sele select our patients appropriately. So when I look at my atopic dermatitis data, I say, I don't have an increased risk. The risk is the same as background or even less than background for cardiac events and clotting from the best data we have, but I can still appropriately select patients knowing that this data is out there. So um, how do I think of that? Essentially, in, a, in my patients, I'm you know, thinking if someone's had a history of a blood clot, either in their lungs or their legs, and if they have and they're not on anticoagulation, then that may be a patient I wouldn't choose an oral JAK inhibitor for. You know, I'm thinking about a patient who's had a heart attack or a stroke and, and is not optimized man, uh, medically for that. You know, maybe I would want to choose something else until they are more medically optimized. And then interestingly, the third would be, you know, if someone has an active cancer or a recent severe um, cancer, we actually try to avoid most immunosuppression um, however, when needed, we can still reach for agents and often their oncologists are completely fine with that. And that's something that comes up a lot in my life just because of the dermatomyositis patient cohort I manage. But really the, that segment of the patients is a very small segment. So most of our atopic dermatitis patients are actually excellent candidates for JAK inhibition. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is almost a call to change the paradigm. So many dermatologists are saying, well, let me figure out which is the right candidate for a JAK inhibitor, whereas actually almost all of our AD patients are great candidates for a JAK inhibitor. And really, it's more about, okay, well, let me find the patients who aren't that, that quite a good fit because of uh, comorbidities or what you're saying is comorbidities that are not properly medically managed. Right. And I, I think that's just accurate, right? So like the point being is it's just the rare patient that I can't give a JAK inhibitor to. The vast majority of patients I can safely give a JAK inhibitor to. And so it's just like, like you exactly described, it's just sort of shifting the frame of reference to understand that as soon as you understand how to give these medicines appropriately, most patients are exceptional candidates for these medications. Right. So how important do you think patient history and comorbidities is to your decision-making process? You sort of touched on that in your description, but for, for your everyday uh, practitioner who maybe doesn't have quite as an extensive experience using JAK inhibitors as you do, how should they be using patient history and comorbidities in their de decision-making process? Right? Do you have any practical tips for them? Yeah, I think the practical tips are that I can have this discussion extremely rapidly in the clinic, right? So I think patients or uh, physicians, my colleagues worry like, oh my goodness, this is going to be this like hour long discussion. And that's not really the case, right? 
And so really, again, what I have to risk stratify is sort of those three areas that I just mentioned, which we don't even have evidence to say are a problem in our atopic dermatitis patients, who are still going to be in our best interest of our patient to think about them and select patients appropriately. So I can do that very quickly. In, in other words, if like you were a patient, Chris, in front of me, I would actually say, you know, based, based on early um, information from a patient population that was actually, you know, sicker and has more problems than the disease that you have, I'm still going to ask you some questions to see if this medicine's a good candidate, or if you're a good candidate for this medicine. And I would ask you, you know, have you ever had a blood clot in your lungs or your legs? Most patients, the answer is no. The answer is yes. I go on and say, are you on a blood thinner, right? Because if they're on a blood thinner, they're actually also a good candidate. Then I would say, oh, have you ever had a heart attack? Have you ever had a stroke? And again, most patients, the answer is no. And then we can think about if they have high cholesterol or high blood pressure. And if so, who's managing those with you, you know, your primary or cardiologist, et cetera, just so we're overall taking care of the patient as best as possible. And then have you ever had a cancer? You know, are you up to date on your cancer screening? These are like three simple buckets that I can cover with a patient in literally like a minute or less. And almost all patients who have atopic dermatitis will essentially be an acceptable candidate for a JAK inhibitor after I have that discussion. Yeah, I like that. I've heard you discuss before, Ruthann, uh, the, the cancer, the clotting, and the cardiac uh, comorbidities as the three C's. And so I, I think that, that, that what we want our listeners to, to walk away with is, is how to effectively discuss with their patients the three C's and not be necessarily scared off by them if they're properly medically managed. Yeah. And I think, Chris, you totally bring up the right point, but just the reminder then again to my colleagues, right? Like this is the part that's easier for the physician to understand, right? Like when you look at incidence ratios and you look at actually in our atopic dermatitis cohorts, I also have a strong level of comfort because we don't see these as being, as, as having a signal, right? In our best data that we have. So I'm going to screen and therefore really, really reduce the risk because I'll pick, like if I had a patient who had lupus and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is like our highest propensity to clot disorder. Yeah. Wh why would I give that patient a JAK inhibitor? That's a patient where I should choose to opt for another therapy. Okay. But I also have a high level of comfort in my atopic dermatitis patients because I'm screening them appropriately. And my best data sh shows that the actual risk is the same as the background. So I think that's just really important because we're going to be, we're essentially doing our due diligence and being extra careful for our patients, even when the background risk is not, has not been shown in that population to be a problem. So some oral JAK inhibitors such as upadacitinib have multiple indications that cover various immune mediated disorders. You sort of touched on that. What, do you see that as an advantage in AD patients who have comorbidities? Yeah. So this is like, again, I know I kind of uh, alluded to this before when I gave you my example of, you know, who I'd given um, a jacket inhibitor to for atopic dermatitis, but this comes up all the time in my practice because as you're aware, people who have autoimmunity often have multiple autoimmune conditions and atopic dermatitis is extraordinarily common, right? And so, you know, a huge chunk of my patients who have dermatomyositis and other conditions also have atopic dermatitis. Many of our patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, many of our patients who have um, inflammatory arthritis, right? So essentially you have these patients who essentially need their inflammation and autoimmune system to be turned down, right? Like they need it dialed down a notch. And so there's very few things that I have right now on the market that can fix more than one thing at once, right? And so that's one of the times where we use JAK inhibitors and we rely on them heavily because we'll say, okay, well, not only can this fix your inflammatory arthritis, but as a matter of fact, it may help your lung disease. We know it can help your skin disease and it can help your atopic dermatitis. And so this is like very common reason to reach for a JAK inhibitor in my world. Um, and 
you know, we just have a lot of these patients with sort of overlapping phenotypes. I'd like to move on and talk a little bit more about the onboarding process itself. Uh, As we've established, you have a strong experience using JAK inhibitors. Can you walk us through some of the steps that you take to start the oral JAK inhibitor therapy, such as dosage and administration? Um, Sure, I'm happy to do that. So I think there's a few things when I'm going to consider starting a JAK inhibitor that I just want to kind of break down and make sure I'm going to do, okay? Um, So I'm always going to get some baseline labs. I talk to my patients about having the killed shingles vaccine. And the reason I do that is because as in many of my therapies, we know that there's an increased risk of shingles. And so I like to get the patient to have a dose of killed uh, shingles vaccine if they're willing before they start the therapy. And then they can start the therapy. And because it's a killed vaccine, they can get the second one as they typically would even while on therapy. And then I'm going to talk to them about those kind of the three C's that we spoke about just to risk stratify them and to make sure they're an appropriate patient. And the way I'm going to frame that discussion, right, is that we've actually had these medicines that we're going to talk about for over a decade. So these are not new medicines. However, we're lucky because they were approved for your disease in the last, let's say, two years if we're talking about atopic dermatitis, right? I think that's really important because patients in general, there's a few exceptions, but patients in general don't want to be on like the new medication. And the key here is these are not new medications anymore, right? So they're new to dermatologists on label for about two years, but they've been on label in the U.S. since 2012. So we've had well over a decade of experience and we want patients to know we have that level of comfort. And as a like medical field, we've been using these a lot. And so I kind of talk about that. I walk through the three C's with them. And that's, those are really the steps that I need to take to think about starting an oral JAK inhibitor. So overall, it's literally just adjusting your comfort level to like, like make sure you understand the steps because it's um, a pretty seamless process when you can just um, think about those few steps that you need to take and move forward. What about dosage and administration? Yeah, so JAK inhibitors are oral therapies. So, you know, for many of our patients, that's a nice option because many of them would prefer pills. Um, And the dosing, so this is just sort of like a little historical off-label perspective. We've known for many years that skin diseases across the board often need a higher dose than, let's say, joint disease or muscle disease, not just of JAK inhibitors, but of our other therapies as well, okay? Okay. So it's of no surprise to me that when we got approvals for, let's say, atopic dermatitis, that we have two dose ranges, right? Because we know that these medicines are very dose sensitive. And I feel completely comfortable that many of my patients with severe and refractory disease will need the higher dose. This is the same thing that we learned when I first started using these with dermatomyositis many years ago. When we first started using them, we had for rheumatoid arthritis, tofacitinib at five milligrams twice a day. But when we use them off-label for skin disease, we would use 10 twice a day, okay? So in terms of the dosage, I feel completely comfortable using the higher dose and they're always oral. So I hope that answered your question, but let me know if you have any follow-up. What monitoring protocols do you follow during the initial phase of therapy, if any? All right, so for JAK inhibitors, The lab monitoring is very, very similar to other therapies we give that require lab monitoring. So let's say if you, you know, learned in your training or throughout your practice, like how do I lab monitor for methotrexate, let's say. It's very similar. Okay. So it's not, it's not, it's not particularly challenging. I need baseline labs and my baseline labs are going to check for liver, kidney, blood counts. I'm going to do at baseline, sort of like my hepatitis, serologies, and T-spot. And then I'm going to add in my lipid profile. And the key here, right, is that the best data suggests that lipids may go up in the early in therapy, but on average, maybe 10 points. So let's say if someone's like a 120 at baseline, maybe to 130, but that in the studies, lipids didn't typically result in any discontinuation of therapy, and those lipids don't continue to increase. 
So I would say from a practicing clinician, we of course follow lipids and we want our patients to have, you know, all of our patients to have appropriate control of their lipids. But as my uh, cardiology expert at Brigham, who's literally her full job is to manage the lipids of patients who are on rheumatologic medicines that cause changes in lipids, because there's many others that cause more substantial changes, she will say it's, it's, it's never just the medicine, right? So, you know, in our patients who need lipid lowering therapy, it's often that we have to manage their entire picture, right? So we're having them think about exercise and weight loss, et cetera. Because we know that on JAK inhibitors, the increase of lipids is very small. We see it early and does not continue to climb over time. And so typically we're doing these labs at baseline. And then again, typically around a month and then about four times a year. So fairly simple um, screening. I think that that type of screening, that's exactly what I do with my patients as well. With regards to communicating the benefits of oral JAK inhibitors relative to biologics. How do you have that discussion with your patients? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'd love to also hear how this comes up in your clinic, because I know you see a lot of atopic dermatitis patients as well. Um, so I think we briefly touched on this, but I think the two key points here would be anyone who's had repeated courses of systemic steroids over and over and they're coming to you and they're desperate and they're really needing relief. Like these are a patient I want, this is a type of patient I want to bring up an oral JAK inhibitor right away, right? Like we have to really think about getting them away from this recurrent use of systemic steroids. The second is similar to, again, how I wouldn't a psoriasis patient, you know, really think about the quality of life in my patient and not feeling that, you know, 50% improvement or 40% improvement, perhaps, you know, is sufficient and really asking them, you know, are you, how's your sleep still? Is it, you know, how's your quality of life? Are you still itching a lot? You know, do you want to try to be on something that can bring you more relief? Actually, that's a question I use a lot. Like, would you want to try something if you knew it could, could, you know, bring you more relief from your itching or from your eczema? And these are really things I think we have to ask our patients, right? And these are important because we just need to push the envelope in getting our, our patients closer to clear and clo closer to sort of ideal itch reduction as we can. Yeah, it's, I, I discuss with my patients pretty much along the similar lines. I, what, what I like to emphasize is you know, JAK inhibitors are working inside the cell. So they, they have a, a very quick onset of action in part because they're working right inside the cell at the signaling that's important for driving the atopic dermatitis, whereas the biologics are working outside the cell uh, to try to, at the earliest steps of that signaling process. And, and, and so there can be a difference in the, in the, the, the onset and rapidity of the, the response. However, uh, also it's important to communicate to them that we have enough network meta-analysis. We have enough data now that really shows that indirect comparison, and there are some head-to-head -head trials as well between both upadacitinib and abracitinib and dupilumab uh, that, that show that JAK inhibitors have uh, increased uh, clinical response through easy scores as well as itch reduction. But, but in the network meta-analyses, I always kind of uh, joke, you know, we have the Olympics coming up in Paris, uh, I think starting the end of this week. But, but what we have uh, in the network meta-analyses is three medications uh, that are uh, above the 40% response level of achieving EZ90. Uh, and, and that same top three with regard to introduction and, and, and other ways you cut the data. But those top three medicines are the apatacitinib 30 milligram dose, the abracitinib 200 milligram dose, and the apatacitinib 15 milligram dose. I call it the gold, silver, and bronze of the Olympics, right? The AD Olympics. And, and I think it's important for patients to understand that we have enough scientific analysis that really shows the JAK inhibitors uh, do work better uh, than uh, the biologics for many patients. And, and this is supported, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit more about this, the, the level up data that just came out, where the level up data was really a head-to-head -head comparison between upadacitinib and dupilumab, but using for the first time a very stringent composite endpoint where of easy 90 plus 
itch of zero or one. So you're talking about how important it is to reduce the itch. And if I have a patient that's already on an AD therapy, whether it's a biologic or or a traditional immunosuppressive, and they're 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 still itchy. I mean, it is very clear now from uh, data that if their itch is not zero or one, th then th they need to move on to a better therapy, which is going to be your your systemic jack inhibitor. And and so I I believe now going forward, I, I love having the discussion with my patients that there really is data now showing that the best medicines to achieve this composite easy ninety and itch zero one. It is the JAK inhibitors. And, and, and I think patients, when they understand that there's data behind it, uh, at least my experience has been uh, very uh, favorable that they're, they're excited to try something that's going to work because as you alluded to, that their sleep is suffering. That, and then beyond that, there could be their work life, their school life, pers other personal life. So there's many things that patients are suffering and being able to give them an option uh, that can give them relief unlike anything they've had before. Uh, patients respond to that. Now, they respond to that, but then I know a lot of dermatologists are saying, but what when I when I mentioned the boxed warning, what what do they do? And so that's the next question is how do you address the potential patient questions about the boxed warning? And what do you do you use or what do you say about the long-term safety profile, uh, for example, of upadacitinib? Okay, so great question. So first and foremost, um, I've had this like long standing interest in boxed warnings in dermatology. And I think, you know, Chris, we published an article about boxed warning drugs in dermatology, I don't know, seven years ago or something right now, right? And so the key point here is usually when I'm talking about the words boxed warning, it's because I'm talking to a colleague, right? And I'm actually explaining to a colleague why they need to get comfortable and the fact that they already are comfortable prescribing medicines with box warnings. So, you know, we can joke about this, but all botulinum toxins have a box warning. All anti-TNF therapies, many of our classic antibiotics, pretty much all of my classic immunosuppressive therapies. And in my world, our two safest immune modulators, so hydroxychloroquine, intravenous immunoglobulin, extraordinarily safe medicines that we give to children all the time. Both of those have that boxed warnings as well. And so keep in mind when I'm talking to my patients about these, I'm not saying, oh, this medicine has a boxed warning. I'm using what I know about the boxed warning and picking the app patient appropriately. So like I know who I can't give a botulinum toxin to. I know who I, you know, I know what the risks of hydroxychloroquine are. And so I don't say to the patient, this hydroxychloroquine has a boxed warning and, and scare them about it. I use my best medical expertise to risk stratify, pick the appropriate po populate, patient population and monitor accordingly. So when I talk about a boxed warning for JAK inhibitors, it's because I'm explaining this to my colleagues and talking about how I think about the boxed warning. Now, when I'm with a patient, same concept is with all of my other medicines, right? Methotrexate has a boxed warning. When I started, I don't say this medicine has a box warning. I go through what we have to avoid and what we have to be thoughtful about. And so sort of as we spoke about earlier, with JAK inhibitors, I'm going to frame this as from data in this other patient population that's you know a different patient population. There's things I need to think about to decide whether you're an appropriate patient for this. Let's go through these together and see if you're a good candidate for this medicine. And then I go through those questions. And again, almost all patients are a good candidate and I move forward. And that's how I discuss this. And it's achieving the same objective and using my medical expertise to have my patient know that I really still care, but I'm not trying to scare them either. Just like I, would, I wouldn't when I need someone to go on a botulinum toxin or methotrexate. I need to get the risk across appropriately, but not scare them. Yeah, I like that. And for, I, I think the analogy for from an acne standpoint is, you know, I don't think the last time I've ever talked to an isotretinoin patient and I've started off saying, and here's the boxed warning for isotretinoin. Let's cover exactly. that first. I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't think I've ever said that in my exactly. career, to and be that, honest. That, and that is the way to think of it. That is a perfect example, actually. I'll have to steal that from you, Chris. But it's true. You know, we are so comfortable as a specialty and 
we would be devastated if um, isotretinoin was taken away from us as it's a life-changing therapy for our patients. And if we started every conversation in, let's say, a teen with really disfiguring acne with uh, psychosocial and psychiatric comorbidities, if we started the conversation with the patient or their parents by saying, let me tell you about the black box warning, that would not be a good conversation, right? And we need to make sure we're presenting the information in a way that our patients can understand. And that also really is a true assessment of um, the best medical experience and knowledge about a particular therapy. Yeah, it is an interesting psychological question why we use over 50 or more medicines with box warnings in dermatology, but it's only the JAK inhibitors where it's like the first thing out of dermatologist's mouth. I, I do think that psychologically there is going to be a shift in a, 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 a restructuring of how we talk to our patients. I think patients People are becoming more and more comfortable prescribing JAK inhibitors, and that's certainly the goal of, of this podcast and, and all the others in this series is to help people become more comfortable and, and get away from that. Now, one thing that's really helping, I think, people, uh, when I say people, I mean all providers of JAK inhibitors uh, uh, to you know all their patients, is these providers now have at their disposal what they didn't have two, two years ago, two and a half years ago which is the long-term safety data. And I know from upadacitinib, I think is a year or two ahead of the abracitinib, but, but the, the safety data of both of these medicines is incredibly reassuring. I, I think that if, if dermatologists pay attention to the, the long-term safety data, for example, the five-year safety data of upadacitinib, it's incredibly reassuring because you're not seeing new safety signals. If anything, you're getting reassured these medicines are safer and safer than we could have imagined. And actually, they're as safe as we had hoped they would be. Uh, and, and you brought up a very interesting point, uh, which is the killed shingles vaccine, because in that long-term safety data, the highest uh, event rate per 100 patient years is you know somewhere between three and five events for uh, herpes zoster. And, and, and in those clinical trials, where they had this three to five event rate per, per 100 patient years, only less than 5% of the patients in that trial even had shingles vaccine. And so this particular adverse event, which is the most common, is potentially completely preventable, or at least can be reduced tremendously by taking your approach of the, of the shingles vaccine. Yeah, that's I, I love that. And Chris, I think an important point for people who don't like live in this world every day like I do is people think of the killed shingle, shingles vaccine, you know, brand name Shingrix, as only for people 50 and over. But keep in mind that the CDC, a few years ago now, um, recommended the Shingrix or killed shingles vaccine for anyone who, who's 18 or over and immunosuppressed or on this type of therapy. And so we can get it easily for our patients because insurance will cover it. You know, it's not even like an exception. It's now like CDC acceptable. So, you know, I think this also brings up an important point, which is patients, when they ask you about side effects, they actually want to know what they're going to experience day to day, right? And so I need to counsel about the killed shingles vaccine, or excuse me, the killed uh, shingles vaccine, because that is like, if people aren't vaccinated, that is something I could see. I know I would see an uptick, right? But the nice thing about JAK inhibitors is that our patients feel fine day to day, right? And that's a big change from many of my, my more traditional therapies I needed to use over the last, you know, 20 years. So like when I give methotrexate, I know that they're going to get stomach upset, fatigue, nausea, et cetera, headaches the day after and maybe dripping over into two days after the dose. I know when I give mycophenolate, it's like very classic that oh, many of my patients will get GI side effects. And so, you know, the JAK inhibitors, it's this new, unique um, thing in that people don't have those types of things. They feel fine day to day. You know, they don't have sort of, they often patients will say, I don't even know I'm taking the medicine except that my itch is gone, right? Like they don't feel a day-to-day -day side effect. And that's also, I think, a pretty unique um, thing, which has been great to see, you know, over years with experience that our patients just feel fine when they're on the medicine. So along that lines, let's talk a little bit more about managing side effects and patient adherence to therapy. What are some of the common side effects that you've seen in patients with oral JAK inhibitors and how do you manage them? Yeah. So, I mean, I hate to reiterate what I just said, but, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't see these 
typical side effects in our patients like headache, GI upset, et cetera. Like it's just not something we concomitant, like we current, we often see with jack inhibition. Um, I really will reemphasize if my patients don't take the killed shingles vaccine, I know some patients will come in with shingles, right? So we have many patients in our country who want to decline vaccination in general. It's always just a discussion. I would never withhold a jack inhibitor from them. But if my patient's going to decline that vaccine, I just want them then to be counseled about, well, well, what does early shingles feel like? If you get this, tell me right away so, you know, I can treat you. And then I've at least kind of like told them that, that this can happen and they can be aware to call me if it happens and I can treat it, right? But, but that is sort of the side effect that on a typical basis that I would expect to see in a small chunk of patients if they're not vaccinated. And I think that's, that's why we, you know, kind of reiterate it to our patients. So when you do have that one patient, 80 patient who's on a, a JAK inhibitor and they do develop shingles, I, I presume your treatment of that is your standard valacyclovir, a thousand uh, milligrams TID for seven days. Is that correct? A hundred percent. Yes. And so the only time similar to any of my other therapies where I would change that would be if the patient had like a more severe course or ocular involvement, et cetera. And then we may lengthen the course. Um, and typically, just like any of our other therapies, we would typically hold their immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive therapy during that course just to sort of shorten the duration. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So I once had this patient uh, very early on that I put on a, uh, who had been on a biologic for AD, maybe had, you know, 50%, easy 50 response and, and, and shifted over to an oral jack inhibitor. And the patient was doing really well, but, you know, he's, I think, in his mid-20s and very forgetful, right? One day he would take his medicine, the next day he'd forget. And it was back and forth. <laughs> it's almost like even and odd days of a calendar. He couldn't, couldn't only, only could do evens and not odds. And, and he would describe his itch, like on off switch. The days I remember my medicine, it was off. The days I forgot it, it was on. And so, and so I, I come to realize that not necessarily side effects, but the biggest problem I have in my patients with JAK inhibitors uh, is actually compliance with their oral therapy. Uh, and, and do you have any specific strategies you employ to improve patient adherence and, and to the oral JAK inhibitor therapy? Oh my goodness, if I could solve this problem, my whole life would be easier, not just with jack inhibitors, right? But with like every therapy we give, right? You know, I think the data shows that like with oral therapies, it's like maybe two thirds of patients take their oral therapies regularly and probably like less than 40% of our patients are doing their topical therapies like they should. The data is pretty clear about this, but it's interesting. I actually have, I'd say, increased adherence to oral jacks and atopic derm than in many of my other diseases in terms of oral therapy because of what you described. So, you know, there's a lot of patients who essentially will say like, if I forget my medicine, I know it, right? That's very different than my lupus patients who forget their hydroxychloroquine, right? They notice nothing. They're like, yeah, maybe I don't even need this stuff, right? Until then they come in with a flare. So I agree. There's always going to be some patients where we have adherence challenges, but especially in atopic dermatitis specifically, I find that more of my patients, even if they have a history of non-adherence with other therapies, tend to be more adherent with their JAK because they notice the change and they notice the itch reduction. So that's like one point. I think the second point is just like sort of going back to that battle of like, well, how do we do adherence? And, you know, in some patient populations, that's different than others. You know, my, my strategy always used to be like, can you just keep it next to your toothbrush? And then, you know, I realize now in my younger patients, it's more like, can you set a cell phone alarm, you know, to go along with your whatever it is that they do every day? Like it's, you know, it's kind of crazy, but we do it differently in teens than we do in adults. But it's sort of just going back to those basics about telling them, like, we know that this medicine works for you, but it's not going to keep you doing well if you bounce around on your medicine, right? Because you're going to have these ups and downs. And I also then sometimes, again, I'm like not nearly as a basic scientist as my friend Chris here. He was the smartest person in the medical school class. He understands basic science better than me. But I do try to tell him, you know, we have cells in our bodies that have strong memories, right? We have to put these to bed. And the only way we put these to bed is if we take our medicines regularly. 
Because if we don't, they're just right under the surface, ready to make you itchy again. And that's how I say that in a simplified way. Very good. So it's very obvious that patient education and open communication regarding adherence and compliance is incredibly important. So what I'd like to, to now focus on is some, some case examples, real world case examples. Are you able to share some real world experiences and outcomes from your clinical practice with oral jack inhibitors? I mean, sure, Chris, how many do you want though? <laughs> no, I'm we'll just start joking. with one good one. No, so I'm joking. So, so, you know, we're very, we're very lucky, right? Because not only can we now get jack inhibitors on label, we have different doses, we have different medicines, as you mentioned, like there's a gold, silver, and bronze. So if I have someone with severe disease, probably going to reach for the gold, right? Like that's what I need. So the point being though is specifically with atopic dermatitis, I can give an oral jack inhibitor, you know, often we're giving a patacitinib, let's say, and patients will feel better that week, right? So it is, it kind of is crazy, but it's just like, it just shows you that you can get people who have been very sick with atopic dermatitis for a long time and almost always make them happy, right? And that's just, we just, we couldn't say that before, right? Our most refractory patients, we couldn't get them all better. They were just pretty miserable. And we tried through everything we had at them and we would still be a big struggle. And I think that's probably my biggest take home um, is that we can get really bad eczema. We can make those patients happy now. We just didn't, we didn't used to be able to do that. Yeah. And along those lines, I think for me and my clinic, one of the things that that, that the jack inhibitors have allowed me to do is overcome complacency. And what I mean by that is you have patients that you, with AD, moderate severe AD, you've put them on a biologic, whether it's dupilumab or trilokinumab. Obviously, we have some more coming soon. Uh, but, but if they're on one of those medicines and, you know, they, let's say they had easy 50 or 75 response and their itch went from, say, an 8 out of 10 to 4 out of 10, you probably are like, man, I'm a good doctor. I've done a really good job. I've gotten them better. But it's just not where the standard of care in atopic dermatitis is currently, especially after the level up data showing this composite easy 90 plus itch in, itch in RS of 0, 1 was, was just superior with uh, upadacitinib compared to dupilumab. And so I think that for me, what I realized is not being complacent. When that atopic dermatitis patient is actually better, but they're still actually not meeting easy or itch uh goals or criteria, targets, uh, I, I try to actually do better. So I, I think overcoming that complacency to do better for my patients is actually what the jack inhibitors have done for my practice. Yeah, I um, I love that example. And I know I briefly mentioned this, but I feel like as a field, we've come that far in psoriasis, right? Like we all know that we can get our patients with psoriasis clear. And we can get them free of symptoms. And we that's like our standard. And we just have been slower in atopic dermatitis and we need to catch up in, in atopic dermatitis. We need to get our patients across that finish line and think of them as, you know, in a similar fashion that we want to get our patients itch-free and skin disease-free as often as we can. Do you have any uh, cases that illustrate successful patient onboarding or management? Do, can you think of a patient where maybe it was a struggle to, to get them started, but, but yet there was a great example of, of, of how it all turned out? Um, all right. I have an example. So, you know, I think this goes back a little bit to really understanding that most patients can receive a JAK inhibitor and you just need to think through the steps. I had a patient relatively recently who'd failed biologic therapy, was really miserable and was being referred to my atopic dermatitis program because, you know, other clinicians didn't feel comfortable giving her a jack inhibitor. And that's sort of like what she had left to consider. Okay. So why had they not been comfortable? They hadn't been comfortable because the patient did have a history of a blood clot, but she was on a blood thinner, right? So that's actually like kind of the best, the best situation, right? Because the hematologist will be like, no problem, go right ahead, okay? The second interesting thing in that same patient is she had a history of early stage breast cancer several years ago that had been considered to be cured surgically. And again, that made the other clinician nervous, but 
that is something I deal with every day because of the type of patients I see. And in those cases, the oncologist is going to be completely fine with the therapy I choose. So I took a patient who really had no other therapeutic options and sort of wasn't being able to be given care. And just sort of with experience, knowing that this is still actually a great candidate for a JAK inhibitor and she needs it because of her disease severity and her quality of life impact. Get that patient started really rapidly. She's going to be doing great. And I think that's like sort of just hopefully brings home a few points regarding helping work on our comfort level with these medicines so that patients who need them can actually get relief from their skin disease. Are there any lessons that you've learned from clinical trials uh, and, and other real world applications that you'd like to share for our listeners? Yeah, you know, I think the point you raised earlier regarding clinical trials and just sort of realizing again that although we can be happy when we have easy reduction and itch reduction, the closer we can get to disease clearance and itch clearance, essentially, that's like we can get there. And I think just reminding people, right, that we can get there. We just need to feel comfortable with the medicine options we have. I think that's likely the most important point. Yeah, I agree. All right, so just sort of as we head towards wrapping up this, this wonderful uh, podcast session, uh, are there any potential new indications or off-label uses for oral JAK inhibitors that you foresee? All right. Well, I, I'm going to go back to my own obsession and history with uh, dermatomyositis. And the reason why I think this is exciting, right, is we published our first cohort of dermatomyositis patients eight, nine years ago. And thankfully, there is a company doing a phase three global randomized controlled trial now with a JAK inhibitor for this orphan disease. The therapy is called oral brepacitinib, so a JAK1 TIC2 inhibitor. And really interestingly, that study just completed global enrollment of over 200 dermatomyositis patients. So you know, this would be a phenomenal example of how our understanding of the mechanism of these medicines and what they can do for patients with sort of multiple um, phenotypes, like right? skin, muscle, joints, et cetera. Like one medicine can fix all the components of their disease. And so fingers crossed, that would be a phenomenal addition for the dermatomyositis community if we're able to achieve FDA approval for an oral JAK inhibitor. Ruth Ann, what a wonderful example of, of something to look forward to for a new indication for oral JAK inhibitors. That sounds really exciting, and I can't wait to see more of that phase three data uh, in dermatomyositis. Now, one of the things we talk about atopic dermatitis, it's a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, this is not only in clinical presentation, but even in the cytokine-driven uh, uh the, the cytokine pathogenesis behind the AD. And, and what we, the buzzword term that we use now is molecular endotypes. Not every atopic dermatitis patient falls in the same bucket. The idea is that certain different cytokine profiles may direct or, or cause AD in one molecular endotype, and it may be different than another. And this may help distinguish more acute AD from, from those that develop really chronic, long-standing lichenified uh, AD, for example. And I think one of the things that, that may be coming in the future as we talk more about personalized medicine is being able to actually, with, with biologics, you're targeting one or two of these cytokines. And I think with JAK inhibitors, uh, kind of this, this idea of the molecular endotype, JAK inhibitors can hit multiple cytokines at once. And I think that's why we're seeing such high efficacy, rapidity of response, and itch reduction is because you're sort of covering multiple uh, endotypes all at once with the JAK inhibitor. And so as personalized medicine is getting towards the ability to possibly uh, figure out the specific cytokine profile of an individual AD patient, the JAK inhibitors are sort of circumventing that and saying, we're just going to take care of it all anyway. And, and so it'll be very interesting to see how personalized medicine uh, evolves with regard to molecular endotypes and, and where the oral JAK inhibitors will fit into that space. I think the point is well taken, Chris. And I think um you know, that's probably why we have some patients that just don't respond to a biologic, right? Like, we're like, oh, they should respond, but they don't. And then we can get them to respond to a JAK inhibitor because we have a slightly more broad mechanism of action that helps, you know, a wider phenotype presentation. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So, Ruthann, to, to, to recap, you know, there's a few main points we've discussed today, but you had one sentence that I think summarizes it all. And you said, most patients can receive a JAK inhibitor. And I think that is a very powerful, simple message is that whether you're looking at efficacy, safety, patient selection, the onboarding process, the overall outcome and management, the answer is almost any atopic dermatitis patient can receive a JAK inhibitor. I agree with what I said earlier, apparently. No, but I do. And I think it's just this level of comfort you need to achieve. And we get there with practice. But I think it's also reminding yourself that getting there is not that hard, right? You have to just think of the simple questions, making sure you're addressing these to keep our patients as safe and healthy as possible, but knowing that patients deserve to have their disease as close to cured as possible and that we want to be able to give them the therapy that's going to get them there. So, Ruthann, what final thoughts do you have on optimizing patient onboarding and care for oral JAK inhibitor therapy? What, what do we want to leave our listeners with? Um, I think some takeaways from me would be the fact that I would want you to stop looking for the perfect patient to give a JAK inhibitor to, and I want you to kind of switch your mindset and realize that nearly all your patients are going to be perfect candidates. And you just need to think about screening out a few patients that perhaps aren't the ideal candidate. I also want you to think about how you frame your conversation about JAK inhibitors. I want you to remind yourself that even though these have only been approved in dermatology since 2022, it was 10 years prior to that in 2012 that our first JAK inhibitor was approved. So I want you to think about that in the language with your patients, about how we've had these medicines for 12 years and we're really lucky because we got approval for your condition in the last couple of years. And I think the second along those lines, it's the same way you've developed your comfort level of how to give isotretinoin or another medication with a boxed warning, how to have that conversation and still convey the safety and the efficacy of the medicine to ensure that your patient gets the treatment that they need. Thank you, Dr. Ruth Ann Vlegos, for your invaluable insights. Listeners, uh, there are going to be more resources uh, at the website, the Live Derm website with this podcast. And please stay connected uh, for future episodes of our, our podcast, the program on JAK inhibitors uh, for atopic dermatitis. We look forward uh, to seeing you in the future. And thank you so much uh, for listening in with our esteemed uh, colleague, Dr. Ruth Ann Vlegos. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Stay tuned for our next episode in this series featuring Dr. Naeem Issa. Thank you.